Uh, <laughs> I want to give you an update on Mountain View. Once I get this all settled in place here, pardon me. Uh, um, as we were singing, I was just reminded of the hymnals. Uh, Fellowship provided, I think, 50 hymnals or some number of hymnals for the church. I'm huh? sorry, 15 hymnals. We still use those today. Those have been a tremendous blessing to us. We use those every Sunday morning. Um, church provided a keyboard for the church. We use keyboard every Sunday morning. That's been a blessing to us. Uh, and I was thinking about the little bag there. We, we use that for an offering every Sunday. Fellowship gave us one of those bags. So I uh, just want to thank, thank you all so much as far as helping us as well with the insurance. That's been a blessing as well. Uh, <clears throat> It's been a busy four weeks. You know, I was just thinking as well, we've crossed over the one year anniversary of the church. So it's been a year and almost two months now. It doesn't even seem like it. But um, we've been really busy the last four months. Brother Carver preached for us uh, three weeks, maybe four weeks ago, I'm not sure. We had the Lord's Supper on the same day. We um, had Easter the following Sunday and then Last week, we had some special guests, a special service, and Bethany was baptized on that same Sunday last week, so praise the Lord for that. And then uh, this week, we had Jeremy Pinero, missionary to Vanuatu, and his family. The church has supported them ever since we started, so uh, that was a blessing as well. We're going to finally get down to a normal schedule, I think, I hope, uh, back to just the normal craziness uh, next week. Um, We've had our challenges. Um, God has tested our patience specifically over the last several weeks. I'm sure Pastor Bram Bramblett could, could not identify with that, but we've had some very specific issues we've had to deal with and some tests of patience and humility, but uh, God has brought us through that. I think we're doing well. Uh, we do what we call a water bottle outreach. Uh, sometimes I door knock. I don't always do, go door knocking every week. We do this thing where we take bottled water and we go just go stand out in the middle of Nambour. Um, we put the water on ice and get it nice and cold. And we set up, me and Guy Phil, who is the member husband of the family, and we just stand there and hand out, hand out water bottles. And people come by and they take those and we hand them a church invitation. Those seem to have worked pretty well. Um, Nambour does this thing every Thursday where they open up a certain part of the city to what they call a new age flea market. They have these booths. Some of them are palm readers. Some of them are tie-dye. Uh, you know, these hippie kind of things. Um, they have other things, uh, incense and that sort of thing. Well, we're not allowed to actually sit up in that, but we can sit up next to it. So people, when they walk to that, they come by our free water and we give them, give them free water <clears throat> and so that's been pretty successful we haven't seen but one visitor as a result but people know that we're there and we've had people thank us for doing that because you know we're not just in their face they come to us and we hand them an invitation so we're going to continue to do that we'll see where the lord where the lord leads <clears throat> i haven't really thought of a title for the message i don't i don't really title messages i'm not known for that uh, but it's the general theme on the message is Christian living, if you couldn't tell by the songs, uh, victorious living in Christ. Um, let me ask you this question. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your Christian walk tonight? If zero were completely defeated, just living in defeat, and if 10 were completely victorious, no problems whatsoever, how would you rate your walk with the Lord tonight? Now, I hope that nobody would say I'm a 10. And I say that because I think that we could all stand to continue to grow. You know, if, if we were a 10, uh, there would be no more need for Christ to continue to work in our lives and improve us and make us more like Him. But are you a zero, maybe a one? Or do you feel like you're on the other end of the scale? Well, let me, ask, let me rephrase the question the same scale from 0 to 10, how would you rate your own personal effectiveness to, to other people? When other people look at you, 
would they say, would they say well, I don't want to be like him or her. I wouldn't be a Christian because of what I see. Or would you rate it on the other side where you, you feel like you're effective and people look at you and they see an, a shining example of who a follower, follower of Christ should be? Uh, kids, you can even ask yourself that question tonight. You know, amongst your friends, how would you rate your own personal walk with the Lord? I don't know, maybe you don't have a walk with the Lord. How would, how would you rate your, your testimony to other people? Well, the Bible deals with this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'm going to look at that, chapter 2, verse 14, <clears throat> 14 to 17. Chapter 2, verse 14 to 17. The Bible says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. You see, that's where we ought to be tonight. We should be triumphing in Christ. It maketh, us, it maketh manifest the savor of His knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Do you, you ever think about that? We're a savior to a savor, a smell not only to those who are saved, but even to the lost and dying. Uh, we're to be a saver to everybody. Well, the Bible continues, to the one we are the saver of death unto death, and to the other the saver of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? We're going to answer that question tonight. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God, but as a sincerity but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Um, I want to address three different people or persons or personalities based on this passage. There are those who I'm going to call the corruptors. Uh, the Bible here says they corrupt the Word of God. Then there are those who are uh, triumphant and cri triumphant. I call them the conquerors. And then there's Christ. Three C's tonight. We have the corruptors, the conquerors, and then we have the Christ. All dealt with in this passage. The corruptors, the church in 2 Corinthians was dealing with a certain group of people who were merchan merchandising off the Word of God. Now what they were doing was they were peddling God's Word for profit. If you know the name Simon the Sorcerer, we find him in the book of Acts. Simon was apparently converted, and then he saw the disciples laying on the hands on people, and the Holy Spirit was entering into those people of whom they were laying their hands on. Remember that? And then Simon looked at that, and he offered money and said, I want, that, I want to do the same thing. And then Peter caught wind of that and said, uh, Your money perished with you. You know what Simon was trying to do? He was trying to use God's Word for money. Yeah, he was offering money, but doubtless in his mind, he was thinking, I'm going to use that for my own profit. Uh, there are those who are profiting off of God's Word, not for monetary reasons, but for prestige and for advantage. I believe that that still occurs today. There are those who are seeking simply to use God's Word for profit. You would say, well, I wouldn't do that. Maybe you wouldn't, maybe you would. Oftentimes, as Christians, we think, what can God do for me? Have you ever done that yourself? I think, well, God, what can you do for me? You know, you're, you're really doing the same thing. You're using God or using His Word, using His name, to say, God, I want you to do something for me. I'm going to merchandise off of God. I think about, and you may not be able to identify with this. In the United States, obviously I'm an American, so I have a lot of analogies from America. There's always this poster, and we saw one in Nambour, this poster of Uncle Sam. You may not know who Uncle Sam is. He's a fictitious figure. He represents the government. He's got this big hat in red, white, and blue, and the poster always shows him pointing his finger at you as you're looking at the poster. And it says, I want you. You may have ever seen that picture? Well, there was a president. He was assassinated. His name was John F. Kennedy. 
And he was known for this quote. He said, ask not what your, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. You know, it's the same attitude. We ought to be asking God, God, what can I do for you? Not what can you do for me? How can I use God and His name and His word to do something for me? I think I shared this once before when I was here working in this church, but when I was a teenager, uh, a buddy of mine and I, would we worked together, and we would go late at night after we worked at KFC, and we would just go cruising in his, in his ute pickup truck, his ute. And one night we were driving, and we, came, we were driving down a country road, and sure enough, there was a big snake in the road, uh, two meters long. And it looked like it was dead. So I said, pull over, because we had hatched up this scheme that we were going to take the snake and hang it on somebody's door that we knew and knock on the door and run and watch him freak out. So we, he parked on the side of the road, and I went and grabbed the snake by the tail. And the snake is just flopping around. I thought it was dead. Uh, put it in the floor of his, of his ute. Well, <laughs> if you know anything about snakes, you know when they're cold, they don't move a lot. But when they start to warm up, they come back to life. I didn't know that. <laughs> so we're going down the road. The snake is between our legs, and he started moving. Well, the next thing I know, I hiked up the skirt, and I'm dancing on the seat of his truck. I said, pull over, man, pull over. He's like, why? I said, the snake is coming back to life. Well, he pulled over, and he jumped out and left me in the, in the truck with a snake, and his, the door on this side wouldn't open on my side, so I had to get out on the other side. Somehow we managed to get the snake out of the truck, out of the ute, and then we were on our merry way. I had a few choice words for him for leaving me in there like that. But my point is this. The snake appeared to be dead, but it deceived us because in reality it was just asleep or dormant, whatever you call a snake when they're cold, and then he came back to life again. You know, the church was dealing with the very same people they appeared to be Christians, but in reality, they were corrupting God's church because they were corrupting God's Word. And they were in it for themselves. They were changing the Word of God. Revelation talks about two churches, Ephesus and Pergamos. Um, Jesus was writing letters to these churches. I'm not going to go into detail all the letters, but both of those churches had one thing in common. Jesus said, I know that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Both of those churches were known because they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Who were the Nicolaitans? I studied that and nobody comes to a consensus on who they were, but there is a general consensus that they, what they taught was this. Because God is a graceful God, God is a graceful God tonight, I believe that. Because of God's grace, they were teaching, well, it's okay then to sin. Because the more you sin, the more God gets to exercise His grace. Wow, <laughs> that's convoluted. But they were teaching this. And the church at Ephesus, the church at Pergamos, uh, Jesus commended them because they said, no, that is perverting God's Word. That's perverting who God is. You know, we can pervert the Word of God tonight and not even realize it. Certainly, you, you've heard, maybe you've heard this one, not necessarily in the church. Uh, God's, a God's a God of love. He will never send anybody to hell. You ever heard that one? I hear it all the time. Uh, God's a God of love. He would never send anybody to hell. Well, there really is no truth to that. The Bible says that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. But we can't blame God when people choose to go around every obstacle that God puts in their path from going to hell. But, but yet, people will pervert the Word of God and say God would never do that. Maybe you've heard this. Uh, how should God, why would God let you into heaven? Well, the person would say, well, I'm a good person. God's going to look at my life He's going to look at the good and the bad and He's going to outweigh, he's going to weigh them both and the good is going to outweigh the bad uh, and He's going to let me into heaven. 
Well, you know, those very same people, you can say, do you believe that Jesus Christ came to earth? They'll say, yes. Do you believe that He, he suffered and died for your sins? Yeah, I believe that. Do you believe that He, he was buried and He rose again? Oh, I believe that. But I still believe that God will just look at my life and He'll let the good outweigh the bad, and He'll let me into heaven. Well, that makes God a lunatic. God would be an absolute lunatic to let His Son come to earth and go through all of that if we could just go around that and go, get to heaven our own way. You see, people pervert the Word of God. And believe it or not, there are churches today who actually will teach that. They, they will teach that as long as you're a good person, all roads lead to heaven. Just be a good person. The Bible is an ancient book. It's not relevant today. Right? You heard that one before? You know there are churches that leave out parts of God's Word because they feel well, it's just not relevant anymore. It was relevant to their culture of that day, but uh, they, they don't really apply to us today. You know what they're doing? They're perverting the Word of God. They're corrupting God's Word. And when we corrupt God's Word, we're, we're corrupting His name. We corrupt God's character, and we corrupt exactly who He is. They slander the Word of God. You can go to churches all around the city, and you won't hear the word sin one time. I'm so thankful for churches that teach about sin. I'm thankful for churches, and I know this because we have people that come to our church and they say, you're the first one we've heard that has mentioned the word sin. Well, you know what? We could gather a huge congregation if we just left out that three-letter word, sin. And I can tell you this, we've driven people away. We've had people swear at us because we mentioned the word sin and it brought conviction on their lives. But if we leave that out, we slander God's Word because we're leaving out part of the truth. Romans 6.1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we can... Oh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, I had a reference in the wrong place. I'm sorry about that. Uh, treating sin lightly is really what we do when we leave out sin. We make it such that, well, God will just kind of look over my sin. Living an unclean lifestyle. You know, we can slander God's Word by doing that. Living an unclean lifestyle. But we can also deny the sovereignty of God. This is, where, this is where we as Christians can do this. God is sovereign. We believe that. But yet, in our own lives, we can deny His sovereignty. How do we do that? Well, doesn't God want every aspect of our lives? He wants our finances. Uh, he wants our entertainment. He, he wants the way we treat other people. Every aspect of our life, God wants us to submit to Him. But go home tonight and consider what you turn on when you turn on the TV. And you think, would, God, would I be comfortable watching this if God were in the room with me tonight? Well, if God is sovereign over your life, then that should control the things that you watch. That should, that should control the things that go in those eyes, that go in those ears. But yet we deny a sovereignty and we say, I know that God is sovereign, but this is the area of my life that I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I think about the way we treat other people. I had an opportunity last week to really come unglued on somebody, and I'm ashamed that I got that close to it. But oftentimes, just the way we treat people, we deny God's sovereignty. Because God says that we're to be humble. God says that we're to turn the other cheek. God says that we're to bless those that curse us. We're not to return evil for evil. But if the truth be told, in our own personal closets, we know that we would be ashamed of the way we've treated other people in light of God's Word. We deny His sovereignty. We need to be so careful that we don't corrupt the Word of God. And we can unintentionally do that. But rather, let us be conquerors. The Bible here says that, that God always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of His knowledge. If we let Him, we can choose to be conquerors and we can choose not to. 
You know, it really boils down to a choice. Some of us are conquerors. Some of us are defeated. It, it's really a choice tonight. And it's a conscious choice that we make. Have you ever heard of the conquistadors? The Mexican, I'm sorry, the Spanish conquistadors? And how the, they conquered South America? I, I think it was in the 14 or 1500s. Uh, don't catch me lying here. I don't remember. I should know this, but... The story is, or the, the account is that when they arrived on the shores of South America, Hernando Cortez said, okay, burn all the ships. Set them afire. Well, why did he do that? Because he knew that once his men began to face adversity, some of them would be tempted to go back to the ships and go back to Spain. But he knew that if he burned the ships, they were going to be forced to march forward and that's exactly what happened. Because he removed all obstacles and all temptations, they were able to march forward and conquer South America. Now, I'm not here to tell you what they did was right or wrong and how they treated people, but what I'm telling you is they conquered because he removed the temptation. There's a cause and effect relationship here. Triumphing in Christ, triumphing, if that's a word, triumphing in Christ causes the savor of his knowledge to be manifest. You know, if we're going to be a savor to the world, we have to be conquerors first. That, that's the cause and effect relationship. We, we can't be the savor of knowledge the Bible talks about if we leave to live defeated lives. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ with, which strengtheneth me. Romans 8.37, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. And, and God wants us to be conquerors tonight. He doesn't want us to be corruptors. He doesn't want us to be defeated. John, 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is He that is in you than He, than he that is in the world. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing, that He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Is there any question that God wants to perform that which He started and complete it? He wants us to conquer. There's, there's no question that the Bible makes it clear we are to be conquerors. And we are to make that conscious decision. When we do so, we'll always triumph. Not because of our own strength, you know, not because of this, but because Christ is living in and through us and He is conquering through us. But here's the thing, and this is something we've had to discover ourselves. Christ cannot triumph through us unless He puts circumstances in our lives that causes, uh, causes Him to prove Himself. You know, by very nature, the word triumph means that we overcome something. You, you don't triumph when there's no adversity. You don't triumph if there's no battle because there's just nothing to triumph over. To be triumphant in Christ implies that there must be a war, a battle, something going on. God allows that. He allows circumstances in our lives so that Christ can prove Himself. And more often than not, we get into situations and rather than allowing God to triumph, rather, rather than seeing that as an opportunity, we try to fix things ourselves. And then we get angry at God because God didn't do something for us. Uh, we may not shake our fist at God, but, but deep down inside, we're blaming God for something. You see, that's, that's living a defeated, corrupted life rather than living a triumphant life. When we're conquerors, uh, two things are going to happen. First of all, death is going to be exposed. You know, somebody said this one time, there's two sure things in life. What are those two things? Taxes. Death and taxes. <laughs> taxes and death. We're all going to pay taxes. Hopefully. Some of us may not. Well, should be, but we may not. And we're also all going to die. Unless the Lord tarries, he's, we're all going to die. Uh, we have a responsibility to expose death. 
Now, I'm not just talking about the physical death. We are all going to have to face at some point or, or another the reality that we're separated from God and the Spirit is going to die because it will be separated from God. It's our job as conquerors to expose that. And we do that when we live a, conquered, a, a, a life that is a conqueror life. We're to spread the light of God when we spread God's light, we expose darkness. Um, I've shined the light before and I've seen cockroaches scramble. Have you ever, I'm not going to tell you where, in a barn. It, we did it in a barn. <laughs> you know, the funny thing about, about roaches is they hate the light. Well, you, you put the light down and they scatter and run and you can just hear them running all over the place. That's what happens when we, when we shine the light of God. Not only through the spoken word, but just in our lifestyle, our victorious lifestyle, people begin to run. They don't like to be around us because we're exposing something to them that they know to be true. Something that, that occurred to me just a few weeks ago, we just celebrated Resurrection Sunday. The world calls it Easter. Um, the funny thing about Easter is when... You turn on the television, you never hear Easter in connection with Jesus Christ, do you? It's always the Easter bunny and colored eggs. I thought this is the most ridiculous thing. This world has bought the notion that this, this furry rodent goes around laying colored Easter eggs. Is that not ridiculous? Christmas. Somehow we've fashioned this story that this fat man in a red suit rides this supersonic sled that is uh, pulled by these gravity-defying tiny little reindeer. We, we laugh at this, but honestly, you know what that period between Christmas, the birth of Christ, and His resurrection represents to the world? It represents the idea that Christ came because this world is condemned. This world is going to face judgment. This, this world is facing death. That's really what Christmas and Easter represent, is that because this world is judged, we can be victorious in Jesus Christ. But here's what the world does. Rather than running to the light, they sugarcoat it and come up with these fantastic stories. Anything to get the, the light off of themselves because they know what Easter and Christmas represent. They represent spiritual death for billions of people who will reject Jesus Christ. But we are to spread that light. We're to uphold that light. We do that in our own personal lives when we live victorious Christian lives. I had the opportunity to work in the Pentagon on a short, very short uh, project when I, when I was working in the engineering field. I was able to, to go in there and help in the rebuilding effort. And I think, you know, the United Nations motto is peace and security. But, you know, the United Nations never stopped 9-11. For all the motto, and the motto, peace and security, and all that they represent, they could not stop the inevitable. And the idea is that this world is condemned, and that is evidence that this world is judged and condemned and will soon die and is winding down by the events that we see in the world today. Life is proposed... Not only are we exposing death, but we're proposing life to the world. Now, I'm, I'm talking about, not in the context of the church, but just living a victorious Christian life. We are literally proposing life to other people. We're showing by our lifestyles that deliverance from this present worldly system is available. We're shining examples of that. When people look at us, they ought to see, now there's somebody, there's something different. What is it different about that person? Why are they able to have joy when this world is going through the turmoil and struggles and death that this, this world is going through? It's very simple. Because we are conquerors. We're more than conquerors. And we have the light of Christ in us. And, and because of that, we're going to live. We're exposing death and we're proposing life. The Bible says that, that as Christians, we have not just life, but we have the abundant life. 
On our prayer cards back in the States, we have this verse printed. It's John 10, 10b. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You know what Christ desires for you and I tonight? It's not just to escape the flames. It's not just to be saved. But it's, it's to experience the abundant life right here and now. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven. We can have peace. We can have joy. We can, we can even have the same long-suffering that God has to this world. We can have that same long-suffering to other people as, as they abuse us verbally and sometimes physically. We can have that, that inner long-suffering that allows us uh, to live victorious in the face of all that. We're ex- Proposing death, but we're also proposing life. But thirdly, I want you to see the third personality here. It's the Christ. Jesus Christ is mentioned. The verse says that uh, Christ causes us to triumph. Or rather, God which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. And then it goes on to say, and who is sufficient for these things? You know, nobody is sufficient in and of themselves. No person, if left to themselves, is any good. Now, I'm not here to say that, that God does not value people. He loves people. And we should love people. We should have compassion on people. But we have nothing to offer God in and of ourselves. Only through Christ working in us are we valuable to God. In and of ourselves, I think of it this way. We've, we've had a few gardens. I've had a few lawns. We've been homeowners in the past. One thing I've noticed is that if you leave a garden or a lawn to itself, it will never grow grass. Does it? It always grows weeds. Why is that? Why, I don't understand why it's weeds and not grass. But, but it, it always grows weeds instead of grass. You have to prune it. You've got to manicure the lawn, you've got to put fertilizer, you've got to coax that grass to come, or it, it won't come. We're just like a garden. If we're left to ourselves, all we're going to do is grow weeds. Uh, it's, it's just human nature. If, if we're anything, it's because of God. No person by nature cares about the things of God. Not in our own human nature. You know Romans 5.10 says that when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Before you and I were reconciled, we were enemies of God. Before Christ entered into our lives, if you're a child of God tonight, before His Holy Spirit entered in, we were His enemies. Oh, you, you may not have thought of yourself that way. I don't know, maybe you're not a child of God tonight. and Maybe you say, well, I'm not an enemy of God. I'm just not for Him. Well, according to the Bible, you're either for Him or against Him. You're a friend or you're an enemy. You're condemned or you're not condemned. There's no middle of the road. No person by their own nature has any spiritual discernment. Oh, there's a lot of people out there that want to tell you about the Bible and what they think about the Bible, but they don't know God. They they can look at the Bible from a purely academic perspective, but they don't really understand. 2 Corinthians 2.14 But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto them. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Uh, I, I've, had, I've had discussions recently with people, and they've come up with the most fantastic things about the Bible that I know not to be true, but you can't convince them otherwise, because they're spiritually discerned. We need God's Spirit to... Help us understand this. I believe there's enough in here for a lost person to be saved, but the deeper matters of the Bible, we need the Holy Spirit to help us with those things because they're discerned. No, the point I'm trying to make here is nobody is sufficient in and of themselves because the question is, who is sufficient for these things? The answer is in Jesus Christ. He's sufficient. 2 Corinthians 4, 17-18 for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. You know what's not seen is Christ. The eternal weight of glory is Jesus Christ Himself. He is our sufficiency. 
For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The thing about Jesus Christ, and this is why He's sufficient when we're not, is because He overcame the world. He overcame temptation. He never sinned one time. The Bible never records one instance where He sinned. Every time He was tempted, in fact, the Bible says uh, He was tempted in like manner as us in every aspect, and yet He never sinned. He overcame the world. He overcame death and the grave. How? He was buried, and that He rose again on the third day. And then 40 days later, He ascended up into heaven. And no person's ever done that. I'm pretty sure I've not done that. I'm pretty sure nobody in here has ever done that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the graveyard's full of people who have never done that. One person has ever done that, and that's Jesus Christ. His sufficiency, I'm sorry, uh, He overcame the power of Satan. That's something that you and I can never do. I hear these people of different faiths say, come on, Satan, bring it on. You know, they challenge Satan because they think that they can battle Satan. Only Jesus Christ has ever overcome Satan. And, and we should never think that we, in and of ourselves, have the power to do that. Uh, only through Jesus Christ can we overcome evil in our lives, living that victorious life. Um, our sufficiency is in Jesus Christ. It's through Him that we overcome the world. We can't do it ourselves. We cannot overcome the world. We don't overcome temptation except through the power of Christ. It's only through Him that we overcome death. We are all going to face death one day. Nobody in here is accepted. Some of us are closer than others. And it's through Jesus Christ and through His working in others that we'll overcome. Uh, let me rephrase that. Our sufficiency is in Christ through His working in us. Let me ask you this question tonight. And I want to propose to you four different categories. Uh, you're going to fall into one of, these, one of these four categories tonight. The first category is this. Uh, you're a conqueror and you're in the will of God tonight. And maybe some of you can say that. I, I'm not the one to say you couldn't. I would hope that there would be some people tonight who would say, I feel like I'm a conqueror in Jesus Christ. I know I've got some problems. I know I'm working through things. Christ is still working in my life, but I feel like I'm generally in the will of God. Or maybe you're in this category. You're saved, but you're outside of God's will and you're living a conquered life. I, I, I personally think that the majority of Christians today fit that category. They, they've come to the point in their lives where they're saved. They, they know they're going to heaven, but there's nothing about their life that shows that. They're living a defeated life. Or maybe you're in this category. You're masquerading as a child of God, but in fact you're corrupting God's Word and you're corrupting others because you're living a lie. Now most people would not admit to that. So I wouldn't expect if there was anybody uh, who heard that would say, well, I'm masquerading as a child of God. Because by nature, they're deceiving themselves. And they don't even realize that they're in that category. Or maybe you're in this category. You've never met the king, king of kings. You've never met him and you're living a conquered life. Now, if you're honest with yourself and with God, you're going to fall in one of those four categories tonight. And I believe whatever category you're in tonight, there's always room for improvement. You've heard about this thing called sanctification. It's that process by which when you're saved, the Holy Spirit enters into you and begins this process of molding you and conforming you day by day until one day, and it won't happen on earth, but one day in heaven you'll, you'll be who Christ intended you to be, free from imperfections. Uh, maybe you're in that category tonight. I don't know. But I, I believe that whatever category you're in, there's always room for improvement tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you, you would say, I've never really met the king 
I've heard that name. I've heard the name Jesus. But I've never truly met the King of Kings. And I'm talking about a personal, vibrant relationship with Him. That same relationship where I talk to Him and He talks to me. You know, there was a... <laughs> There was a news program not long ago who called people who heard the voice of Jesus lunatics. I'm not talking about hearing the physical voice, but He speaks to you through His Word. That's the kind of vibrant relationship I'm talking about. Maybe you've never had that relationship with Jesus Christ tonight. Well, the truth be told, the Bible makes it very clear that God loves everybody. God wants everybody to... Uh, to live a victorious life, but you can't do that till you've met Jesus Christ. M maybe you've never met Him tonight. W why not? In a few moments, I'm just going to pray. Um, I know some of you, some of you I don't. I, I can't just assume that we're all saved, born-again believers tonight. Why not just bow your head and say, Lord, I've never met You, but I want to know You. I'm living a defeated life, but I don't want to be like that. I want to live that victorious Christian life. And I want to know that one day when you call me out of this life that I'm going to be able to stand before you and know that you're going to welcome me into heaven because of the fact that I've received that free gift of Jesus Christ. Let me just share real quickly with you what the Bible has to say about what it means to be a born-again Christian. The Bible makes it clear that, that we all are sinners. Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Now that's, that's not just physical death, but that is spiritual death. That is the separation of the Spirit from God in a place called hell, a literal place called hell. But the Bible also teaches this, that if we call upon the name of the Lord, He will save us. If we understand that we're sinners... And because of our sin, we're going to be separated from a holy God in hell. Uh, we also understand this, that Jesus Christ fixed that problem for us. He came to this earth and He took our place on the cross. He lived a perfect and sinless life. He died on the cross, He was buried, and He rose again victorious over grave and sin and death. But here's the thing. You, it's not just enough to believe that. You know what I found in Australia? Most people believe that. Where do they fall short? They have not received that. We have to call upon the name of the Lord. We have to say, Lord, I believe that, and I'm calling upon your name. Come into my life, I pray. Save me from my sins. Maybe you've never done that tonight. Maybe you've heard the message over and over. You've been to church, but you've never actually appropriated that gift. You know, it, it doesn't do anybody any good to offer them a gift if they don't actually take it. I, I could offer you this Bible tonight, and you would say, thank you, but you never take it. Well, it does you no good. God is offering you this free gift of salvation tonight. It does you no good unless you take it. And, and you never know. God may call you from this earth tonight. And, and you would say, well, Lord, I was just right there. I was just about to do it. You know, eternity is going to be full of people who waited just too long. They, they were about to do it, but they held off just a little bit longer. And unfortunately for them, it's too late. Don't let it be too, too late for you tonight. You can live a victorious Christian life, but it begins with that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads? I'm just going to offer a quick prayer, and I'm going to let Pastor Bramblett uh, close out this time. Lord, if there's somebody in here tonight who has heard this message, uh, maybe young, a very young person, and maybe an old person, I don't know. It may be somebody who's been coming to church for years and years. And they've heard this over and over, yet in their heart of hearts, they know they have never really received that free gift. Lord, would you impress upon them tonight, convict them, let them know that there's no assurance of the next breath. There's no assurance that if they leave this church tonight, that they'll ever make it home. I'm not trying to be morbid. I'm trying, trying simply to, to make it clear, God, that we don't know when you're going to call us. Lord, would you impress upon them the need tonight to call upon your name, to begin that process, to begin that 
time in their life when you can begin to shape them and mold them into who you've intended them to be. It begins with that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, calling upon His name. Father, I pray if there's somebody here tonight who has never done that, but they want to do that, God, give them the courage tonight. Give them the courage to admit that to you and perhaps even admit that to somebody else. Lord, I would consider it no greater privilege than to take this Bible and to show somebody how they can know beyond a shadow of a doubt if they were to be called out of this earth tonight that they would have a home in heaven. And I pray, God, that you would, if there's somebody here tonight who is like that, that you would give them the courage to come to me, Pastor Bramblett, and say, I want to be saved. I want to be born again. Lord, help us tonight to, to live a victorious life. Help us to understand that the stakes for doing so are much greater than what we would think. The world is looking at us. The world is making decisions about God based on what they see in, her, in your people. Lord, if we're living a defeated life, the world looks at that and says, I don't want anything to do with that. But yet when they see a victorious Christian, whether they want to admit it or not, they say, I want that. That is something that I want. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to do so. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.